They are, are committed to playing baseball, to becoming professionals. But even with that, they appreciated these young men and women who made a commitment to serve and die for their country. I pray that wouldn't happen for them. <clears throat> But the reality is, young men die in war. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to 1 Samuel 15? I gotta say, Grandma and Grandpa are having a rough time with this. I know my mother is, but Grandma and Grandpa are too. First Samuel chapter 15, long reading. I'm reading from the New International Version. I'll not ask you to stand, but I would ask you to follow along. I'll be jumping around from scripture to scripture. I'm not reading it in its entirety. So follow along as best you can. Beginning with verse 1, Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says, I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them, put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Verse 7. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle and the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Verse 19. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder. The best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? 
To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Verse 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king of Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. May the Lord add his blessing upon the reading of his word. I have a split text today. Verse 22. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. And the second part, verse 23, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you as king. I have some questions for you from the Lord for all of us. Has the Lord much delight in you by your offerings of what you give and the amount you give? Has the Lord much delight in you by your sacrifices? Personal cost of what you give, how you give, your attitude of sacrifice, be it time, money, service, etc. Does the Lord have as much delight in these as He does in your obedience to His Word, to the voice of God? to his instructions. Our scripture tells us that to obey is better than sacrifice. This account in 1 Samuel reveals what God truly looks at in his people. As believers, we need to learn that why we do what we do is more important to God than what we do. God wants to know what motivates us. King Saul, according to the scriptures, was full of himself. He had been given specific instructions as how the Lord wanted him to deal with the Amalekites. He was to totally destroy the inhabitants, for they had set themselves up against God's chosen people, and it was time for holy retribution. Everything living was to die, and he, he wanted it removed to eliminate the evil so tempting to his people. Saul went to battle, and God gave the Amalekites into his hand. But when Saul captured King Agag, he let him live. That's like telling the devil to flee and then asking him to sit down at your table. <laughs> they kept also the best of all the livestock and everything they found that was good and of a value. But if it was worthless, that's what they destroyed. The next day, God told the prophet Samuel, how he regretted ever making Saul king. For he had not carried out the commands of the Lord concerning the Amalekites. Samuel, the prophet of God, was distressed. And he cried out to God all night for Saul. Apparently to no avail. 
or at least until he was clear as to what God wanted him to do about this situation. Samuel rose up and went to where Saul and the people of Israel were encamped. Samuel was told, Saul set up a monument to himself at Carmel. When Samuel came, Saul told him that he had done as the Lord commanded. Strike one. I like this. God has a great sense of humor. Samuel said, what is that sound? The bleeding of sheep? The mooing of the oxen? And the implication here is Samuel is saying to Saul, you did not bring them to fight this battle. So if you destroyed everything as the Lord commanded you, where'd they come from? Strike two. Saul's been found out. Saul does exactly as we do. And as his ancestors did. He blamed someone else for this folly. The people wanted to keep the best of the livestock, so they took them for themselves, but we destroyed everything else. Saul, when cornered with the truth, first thing we do is don't take responsibility. Blame everybody else. The most popular phrase in America today, it's not my fault. I didn't do it. They did it. He did it. She did it. I don't know who did it. What do you mean? Isn't that true? We blame everybody else. We don't want to take responsibility. That's the humanness of us. Besides, and now Saul's dealing with God. He definitely don't want to take the blame for this. Okay, Saul's thinking that didn't work. He thinks to himself, let's try this lie. And he says, they took them to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Still, it's their fault, but let's try to make it that our purpose was honorable, even though we didn't do it exactly as we were told. Besides Samuel, he's your God. Saul has rejected God in his effort to cover his true motive and intention. That leads us to our scripture text. Does the Lord delight in offerings and sacrifices as He does in our obeying the, the voice or word of the Lord? There is a profound implication and a major spiritual application to this passage of Scripture. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. How often do we find ourselves not quite doing something as the Lord commands, and we try to justify and explain it away by treating our disobedience as if we had a real good and purposeful motive. We do it the way we want to. We set ourselves up to be the one patted on the back. And the one getting all the accolades. Isn't that the same thing as Saul setting up a monument to himself? Look at me, how great I am. Then just like Saul, we keep the best for ourselves and we tell God, I did it for you. Now through Samuel getting in Saul's face, God wants to get into our hearts. 
Your money offerings make you feel good, but are they better than obedience to the Lord God? Is an hour a week of your time better than obedience? We keep the rest of the time for ourselves and do what we want. Three-hour football games, four-hour races, but oh, that preacher better keep the service short and have us out by noon. I'm hungry. Many attitudes are just like this, and as an evangelist, I ran into this all the time. Forget about Sunday night services. I'm too busy. Wednesday night? Oh, I'm too tired. How about coming out to revival? Oh, heaven forbid, don't ask me to come to revival. Forget about that. The church is lucky to get me most Sundays for an hour. I know I'm stepping on toes. But that's my job. What about the Lord? How lucky is He to get you most Sundays for your life? Your talents, your skills, are they used to promote yourself or God? Are they better than obedience? Will sacrificing from your money, time, and talent for Him please the Lord? Well, the answer is yes and no. Yes, if the motive is truly to glorify the Lord and what you offer is not just taken from your excess, that will bless Him and please Him. But no, if the underlying motive is to promote yourself and your image to, the, to others for a pat on the back, that does not please God. If the people of God are disobedient to the word of the Lord, the amount of money, the time and talent given means nothing to Him. Obedience above all else. That is what our Lord wants from, his, from us, from His people, especially those of us who claim to be His own and love Him. Help us, Jesus. Our obedience needs to be out of a love for God and the sacrifice Jesus Christ made on our behalf for salvation. Obedience out of thanksgiving for what He has done and what He has given to us mercy and forgiveness. Obedience as the motive, the cause, the reason of what we give, what we sacrifice, what we offer Him. The motive is what pleases God, not duty, not ritual, but the why we do what we do. We must want to please God because He has forgiven us. We must want to obey God and please God because He saved us. We didn't do it ourselves, folks. We are obedient and want to please God because 
he continually pours out his blessing and grace upon us. And we don't deserve it. When we're disobedient. Why is obedience to the voice of the Lord or the Word of God so important? Because God knows better than we do what is needed and necessary for a holy life. And we are we humbly acknowledging that if we do it our way? If we do it our way, and I can probably have a testimony service in this one. If we do it our way, most likely it's going to be wrong. Do it the way God says it should be done. He'll make it right. Saul, like so many of us, thought, since I am one of the Lord's anointed, I should be able to do it my way and still please God as long as the end result is that I get to call it worship of Him. A lot of fallacies in that way of thinking. Can there be any true worship of the living God if there's not obedience? Saul worshiped God with a monument to himself. Do you think that blessed God? This is not unlike today's church members who give a large donation with a requirement that everyone knows about it by the announcement in the bulletin or the little plaque attached to the item given by, presented by whoever. And then there are strings attached. Well, Pastor, if you ever want to get this out of the church, give it back. do we build a building and have it named after our benefactor? What's the motive? Where's the worship? Can we actually call that obedience? God knows the heart motive. We can't hide it from him. If somebody wanted to worship God by giving a gift of whatever to bless the church and to honor the Lord and only he and the pastor know who it was, the people will thank God for his blessing and God gets the praise. Amen. He, God, then in turn will pour out more grace more mercy, and love upon those who remain upright to the word of our God. When we seek praise and acclamation for ourselves, we take the praise from God selfishly. That plus being almost obedient is what Saul did in this passage of Scripture. He was almost partly, but not quite completely, obedient. Saul did just enough to make it look like he was obedient and worshiping God. The people with him thought it was good. He it was king after all. Saul even asked Samuel, what's wrong with what the people did. Saul didn't seek God until he was called on his deceit. Never checked in with God. Can I do it this way, Lord? Should I do it this way, Lord? No, I'll do it your way, Lord. 
He claimed all of his actions were correct and all were for God. Even if it wasn't completely to the letter of the command that was given to him. Shortcuts. Compromise. They don't please God either. They killed everything except Agag the king. They destroyed everything except everything that was valuable. Plus, they weren't going to put all those valuables into the Lord's treasury, and they weren't going to slaughter all the good livestock. They sacrificed a couple, and they keep the rest for themselves. God knew their hearts. He knows our hearts. God knew their motives. He knows our motives. They were keeping some of what was rightfully God's under a holy ban. And if you want holy ban explained, you then read some more of the Old Testament. You'll find out what a holy ban is. And that's usually when God says, I want everything destroyed. I want no remnant whatsoever of these evil, evil people. Get rid of them. Saul and this army were under God's son. The people probably thought it was okay because the king agreed to let them do it. But Saul only wanted the people to like him. It's nice for people to like us and be popular, but not if it means we must be disobedient. We see this going on in Hollywood all the time. Oh, I gotta be popular with my peers, so I'm gonna run down the president, I'm gonna run down the church, I'm gonna swear at Jesus Christ publicly on TV. We haven't learned our lesson yet. Especially the Celebrities who say, I have faith. You have faith in yourself, and that's all. Because Saul rejected the word of the Lord as commanded to him, and then called him Samuel's God, God rejected him and tore the kingdom of Israel from his hand. Saul begged Samuel to go with him before the people to worship God, still thinking of his image. That was his motive for this public display of worship. Even when he said, I have sinned, I have trampled all over God's word and your instructions. We have had a number of televangelists do this exact same thing and then do the same thing Saul did. I'm going to continue to do it my way. I am above the authority of the church. I don't have to listen to them. I'm called of God. Saul could have said the same thing. I'm ordained of God. He made me king. I don't have to listen. Samuel's telling him, oh, yes, you Because Saul had let the opinion of the people concerning him drive him and influence his decisions that he made, his confession was not sincere since he was still blaming the people for the whole mess. Saul, not once, took responsibility. God still rejected him. Samuel cried all night. 
in his distress. And verse 29 says, He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind. And another version says it this way, He says what he means and means what he says. There used to be an old saying back in my early days as a Christian. If God said it, I believe it.